Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burns. Joining us today is our colleague, Ryan Bourne. He occupies the R. Evan Scharf Chair for the Public Understanding of Economics at Cato. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Ryan. Good to be with you. Hi. You've written that the focus on income and services has blinded the debate about poverty from the truth that there are lots and lots of state, local, and federal policies that increase the price of goods and services the poor spend a disproportionate amount on. What do you mean by that? Well, I think conservatives, liberals, libertarians, uh, progressives, um, we all have different theses and, and ideas for what the causes of poverty are and the causes of um, certain households um, suffering from being very, very low income. Um, but in terms of how we go about alleviating poverty, I think it's fair to say that there's been a consensus over many, many decades that the most effective way that the, the government can can help alleviate poverty is through uh, what I'd call an income-based approach. Now, that either means uh, transferring resources to poorer people uh, directly uh, through means-tested welfare, um, kind of indirectly through benefits in kind, which then reduce the amount that poor households have to spend on certain services uh, like healthcare, or indeed through mandates and regulations such as minimum wage regulation controls on the prices of certain goods and services, rent control, for example. Um, now, what I'm trying to, to get across in this paper really is that in part, the reason why governments are having to or see the need to engage in such policies is to compensate for some of their existing mistakes elsewhere. Um, so there's a lot of things that governments do that raise the cost of what I describe as essential goods, basic necessities that that every household in the country needs, but which the poor spend disproportionately on. If you look at um, the bottom 20% of the population, about 60% of their total spending goes towards shelter, food, transport and clothing and footwear alone. In each of those areas, governments undertake policies which drive up the cost of living. So I'm trying to turn the debate around in this paper and say, rather than always reaching for new ways to try and um, uh, compensate people or raise incomes of people. Actually, what really matters to people is their real incomes and how far uh, the income that they do have goes in achieving a decent living standard by acquiring goods and services. And there are many, many things we can do moving things in a free market direction to reduce the cost of living through supply side reforms in all of these markets. When you say that the, the bottom 20% of the income distribution spend 60% of their income on that bucket. Sorry, 60% of their total spending. Of their total towards. spending is on that bucket. How does that compare to the other income quintiles? So for the average household, um, it's about 51%. So still a very, very significant chunk, but you know, a, a, a bit lower. Um, I think it's right. In, I'm right in saying that for the richest quintile, we talk about 47%. So these things are significant costs to people across the income distribution, but they're disproportionately uh, borne by people in the in the lower fifth. And of course, that excludes things such as uh, utilities and, and uh, healthcare and energy costs as well. By the time you include all of those things, you're looking at, say, 70 to 80 percent. But I kind of had to stop somewhere in my paper because I didn't have all the time in the world to write it. But this it seems like you're more... Uh, increasing the denominator in that percentage of your, if you have to live in Washington D.C., you have to pay a certain amount of rent. Uh, it's hard to go under six hundred a month, let's say. And so, if your denominator, your actual wages go up, uh, then your proportion of it, if everyone's paying thousand dollars for rent, if you're poor, that's much more bigger chunk of your income than if you're richer. Uh, or is it the case that the poor also have different buying habits? Because you mentioned apparel and, and weirdly footwear. Uh, which I thought was the most specific thing you put in there. Is 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 there also a buying habit difference? Uh, well, I was talking about spending here and, course, yeah, and not yeah. income. Uh, but you're right in the averages um, hide as hide probably much more than they tell us. Obviously, if you are, if you're somebody who's living in Washington D.C. or New York, uh, the amount that you spend on rent and probably the pr proportion that you spend on rent is going to be much higher than in many rural areas. If you've got children, now one of the things I haven't talked about but is included in the paper, if you've got children, then obviously you're much more likely to be spending on childcare services um, than if you don't have children, um, unless you're, you're compensating somebody else uh, for childcare services. 
So you're right in that sense. Now, in some of the areas that I write about, you're also correct in saying that the poor have different spending habits. Um, so if you look at clothing and footwear, uh, for example, um, there are kind of two effects here. Uh, the poor tend to spend more as a proportion of their total spending on clothing and footwear than people higher up the income distribution. So um, anything that raises the price of clothing and footwear is regressive in that sense. But actually, a lot of these, um, well, a lot of the protectionism that comes um, on clothing and footwear is doubly regressive in that the particular products to which um, higher tariffs apply uh, are more significant on low quality, low price goods than higher price goods. So to give you an example, um, a an acrylic sweater has a tariff rate for countries that US doesn't have free trade deals with, has a tariff rate eight times higher than the tariff on a cashmere sweater. So, so, so there's in all of these things. Primarily, I'm looking at areas in which the poor spend a disproportionate amount. But even if you drill, sometimes if you drill down within those categories, you find that some of these policies are doubly regressive. But these policies, the various regulations and tariffs and restrictions and whatever else, it's not like we're not doing them. Well, tariffs maybe are exceptions. We're not doing them to raise the cost of these goods. We're doing them for we we think that. These services, childcare needs to be regulated to protect people from poor quality childcare, so on and so forth. Um, so we've got we've got these reasons, which might be good reasons. And so then, what's wrong with saying, okay, we we acknowledge that we need these regulations for various reasons. They bring benefits. It would be worse if we didn't have them, but they're going to raise the cost for they're going to raise the cost across the board. But that's going to hit the poor the hardest. So we're just going to subsidize the poor. We're going to give them cash or transfers or whatever else to kind of make up the difference. What's what's wrong with that? Uh, well, that's certainly one way of looking at it. And there are debates of evidently, which I go into in the paper on all of these areas and, and the wisdom or otherwise of, of the regulations to achieve different ends. Um, I've tried to be very, very conservative in the way that I've judged what the price impact of these regulations are. I've also only tried to look at areas where I think there's a clear case that uh, the regulation not only has regressive effects but also adversely affects GDP. And where um, and where appropriate, I've tried to assess whether the regulation is effective in its in achieving its its regulatory goal. So. Uh, the the main example that I I've thought and written a lot about is childcare regulation. You're right in saying that in theory, some of these childcare regulations, staff child ratios, for example, are imposed because the idea is we want um, children to enjoy more more interaction time with the staff, and that will raise the quality of care. Actually, almost all of the literature in this area suggests it doesn't, on any objective measure, improve the quality of childcare. But the overwhelming effect it does have is to drive up the cost of care. And that actually, because of the price effect, because that raises childcare prices and that affects the poor disproportionately, that means poorer households are more likely, rather than use informal centres, to put their kids into home daycare or to stay at home and look after kids themselves. Now, in those areas, we have no idea what the the quality looks like because it's it's measured uh, less object. There's there's less availability of of objective measures there. So I think this is a key point that's often missed in this debate: is that even if, in certain circumstances, some of these regulations could raise the quality or achieve another goal in a particular market, these price effects lead people to substitute away into often more informal markets or lower quality housing or, or, or other settings, which can have an adverse impact on the population as a whole. The main form of childcare regulation, the the ratio thing, or are there other kind of regulations for childcare services? I mean, I'm sure there's you know your standard kind of public health regulations, but are there's like licensing rules or anything like that? Yeah, there are, and that varies state by state. So the two overwhelming, uh, or the two key regulations, I'd say, are staff child ratios, and um, and kind of occupational licensing requirements on on childcare is usually around. Um, how what 
type of education the the carer has to have, whether they have to have a degree in in child development, whether they have to have a high school diploma. Now, this varies dramatically across states. Um, And that's one of the reasons why we're able to obtain such good evidence in areas like this, because there's so much variation. Economists have been able to run quite effective regression analyses that control for a whole host of other factors, like the prosperity of a state and whatever, and try to identify the effects of these specific regulations on on prices or the availability of care. Um, And the overwhelming evidence, particularly on staff-child ratios, where there doesn't appear to be any uh, quality benefit to them, is that these things not only um, reduce the availability of care and drive up price accordingly because of that contraction uh, in supply, but that effect overwhelmingly occurs in lower income areas. Um, Actually, in higher income areas, you often get... uh, uh, a, a greater provision of care because a lot of richer parents are are kind of uh, quality assured by the existence of the regulation. Say, so, well, actually, you know, if I know that my child's going to get a decent amount of interaction time, I'd perhaps be more willing to use formal childcare than I otherwise would. So, again, extraordinarily regressive effects because not only is there the price impact, but the availability of care seems to be restricted most in in low income areas. When you say that the evidence shows that it restrict supply, that it raises prices, but it doesn't, say, with the the staff ratios, doesn't increase quality. How are you measuring quality? Um, Well, there's a whole bunch of different studies that measure quality in different ways. Some measure quality according to fulfilling uh, certain requirements that that lead to almost like a kite mark kind of uh, rubber stamp through some sort of objective measure through some of these um, uh, non-governmental organizations and think tanks that assess things in in that way. Uh, but there is a major question mark, actually, of what quality uh, when it comes to, to, to childcare really means, because quality is an extraordinarily subjective um, uh, variable in, in many ways. And, and some parents, when they're putting their children into childcare, might regard quality as just a, a kind of warm and loving in, environment um, for, for somewhere where their kids can be whilst they're at work. Um, now, almost all of the studies in these areas judge quality according to um, either some independently assessed um, a kind of kite mark or some child development objectives. And one of the things that I've kind of complained about in this paper and in previous work for other organizations is precisely that um, the educationalists are almost taking over this debate and defining what they want the ends of childcare to be, which can be very, very different from what parents actually objectively want from the care for their children. Yeah, you bring up like the preferences of the wealthy, and in DC, you you have this class of people who want to know what the magnet child care center for Yale is, right? That's they're very concerned that that all these educational attainment things are being being sought being realized by their child care. Whereas other people was like, I'd like a warm family environment. I'd like to do the teaching to my kids myself. And and that that preference difference, it seems like the educrats are forcing it on the poor who might have the same preferences or maybe they just want grandma to take care and teach them wisdom of old or something like that. Yeah, it's quite funny actually. I ran into a uh a guy who used to um, used to be head of the Ofsted Inspection Board in the UK, which is responsible for undertaking ins- inspections of childcare centres and actually schools in the UK as well. So this was completely integrated into the educational sector. And I said to him, well, look, um, from a standard libertarian perspective, you do not go round and assess individual parents and judge them according to the, all these child development metrics. They might want to, though. <laughs> so, so why do you why do you insist that uh, when parents outsource their decision for who they want to care for their kids, that the child carers have to go through all this? And he said he alluded to precisely that. He said, "Well, of course, we don't have the resources <laughs> to inspect every parent." Oh, I think there's a lot of people who would like to inspect parents, and oh, just sure. cool. Just in my own experience, when you hear people complain about the education system and they say the real problem is parents, I've had people argue that. So it might be a resources problem. Let's hope it continues to be a resources problem. Let's move on to zoning and housing prices. Uh, something that actually has been getting more attention. I think from both sides uh, over the past few years, at least, than it used to get, especially you have San Francisco and California, which has a particularly bad housing crisis. But overall, how, how does zoning affect housing prices? 
So there's a wide range of economic literature now that shows that restrictive zoning or zoning which attempts to circums circumscribe to a high extent what housing or, or what apartment blocks should look like and the characteristics that they should have um, has an inflating impact on, on housing costs. Um, and that's especially true actually with urban growth boundaries when you try and artificially restrict um, the growth of a city, usually by... Um, suggesting that you can't have any development um, on the outskirts of cities because you don't want to allow urban sprawl or whatever. Now, economists have looked at this in, in two different ways. Um, one way that has been pioneered by Ed Glazer um, is really to compare house prices or apartment prices to the marginal cost of building, the idea being that in a competitive market, price should roughly equate to marginal cost. So he's judged any differential between price and marginal cost of building as a kind of regulatory tax. Uh, and that's shown that in certain metropolitan markets, as you alluded to, that regulatory tax can be very, very high. Uh, in certain areas in California, it can be as much as, as 50%. Uh, but in some major cities, Boston, DC, we're talking about 20 to 22%. Um, and, and even that research was undertaken sort of 15, 20 years ago now. And uh, from everything that we've seen in, in most of those areas, uh, the zoning burden, or at least the binding nature of the zoning burden, might have got worse in the interim period. Uh, but that's been buttressed by a whole... Another slew of research which has um, tried to control for other factors and, and measure this econometrically. And overwhelmingly, all of those studies show as well that um, areas with tight uh, zoning laws lead to higher prices. Now, why is that? Well, it's mainly because by, by imposing all of these conditions and regulations, you make the market less responsive to changes in demand. And we know that housing demand is going up. As people get richer, they demand more in the way of, uh, of housing and bigger space. Lots of people want uh, yards or gardens or whatever. Um, we also know that uh, with with population changes, people are living in perhaps smaller households than they did before. So households are, are dividing up. And when you put all of those different factors in, if you're making the, the, the supply of housing more inelastic, less responsive to changes in price, but at the same time, demand is going up and up and up, that means in certain very, very desirable markets, prices are rising very quickly or have risen very quickly and are structurally high as a result of these policies. What arguments do the people who are in favor of these restrictive zoning things give for this? I mean, so like you hear about Berkeley, California is always griping about how much the median home price is off the charts. Um, but then you hear these stories about blocking anything and everything in terms of building in the area. Um, <clears throat> and so the people who are blocking it, is it that they have no idea that the reason houses cost a million plus in Berkeley is because of restrictive zoning or do they just not care or do they think that there are benefits to this zoning that outweigh the fact that middle and low income people simply can't afford to live there? Well, clearly um, new development has effects on other members of a community. Housing has um, externality effects. Now, whether that's in terms of changing the way that a neighborhood looks or increasing congestion in an area or, or anything else, there's there's going to be externality effects. So that's, that's one thing. Now, you can try and get around that by trying to facilitate bargains between um, uh, existing homeowners and new potential homeowners. So lots of, uh, lots of polities around the world have tried to find ways that uh, as as development is going on, as as the first houses are sold, you extract a certain amount in in taxes, which is then used to compensate um, the rest of the community. So that that's something. Now, the other impact, of course, is um, that an increase in a housing supply in any given area, ceteris paribus. Um, puts downward pressure on house prices, which is not good for people who are already homeowners in a particular area. And that's one reason why zoning laws are so pernicious for the poor, because the poor, much more so than the rest of the population, tend to rent. And an increase in rental costs or increase in house prices and, and, uh, and uh, an increase in rental costs at the same time are unambiguously uh, negative for people that rent. Whereas, you know, if you already own your own home, 
then lots of these zoning regulations are actually beneficial to you. Now, it may, may well not be the case in the long term. And if you're forward looking, thinking about future generations, thinking about the availability of your, your kids being able to, to, to live somewhere that they want to live, you might have a different view. But uh, whereas for renters, this is un unambiguously bad, you know, the, the situation is, is more different for owner occupiers of housing. And, and there are clear reasons why you wouldn't perhaps want new development or at least mass scale new development in the area that you live. So you're saying we should just subsidize homeownership too. <laughs> it was, no, no, that, wasn't that recently proposed <laughs> by Elizabeth Warren, I think, or, or some, of some sort? You mentioned kids, young people. Uh, when we talk about the poor, sometimes we're talking about people beginning in their careers too, 25-year-olds not yet making a ton of money. And it seems that the housing costs in a place like San Francisco or New York City, if you wanted to move there and take advantage of the, as, the, as Ed Glazer says, the, the dynamics of a city to have better economic opportunity, to have better social opportunity, but you're just simply being priced out of living in New York City or San Francisco anymore. Does that have any measurable huge effects or, or measurable effects on people's ability to start a career in an urban environment if they simply can't afford to live there when they're 25 years old? Well, some researchers mm. suggested that the overall impact on GDP is is huge. So there was one study in particular, um, the, the author's name escapes me now, but there, there was one study that suggested that if you reduced uh, the extent and um, kind of tightness of zoning regulation in, in just three cities, New York, uh, San Jose and San Francisco to the to the average across the country, then you could increase uh, GDP by 9%. Wow. Which is a huge, <laughs> that's huge, huge impact. Probably now, now that's been contested, but let's say even on conservative estimates, it's half of that. That's that's still huge. That's still over a, a year's worth of, of economic growth. So we're talking about a monumentally big impact. Now, clearly... Um, if you are if you are young and you're trying to access those those uh, jobs for the first time and you want to move to a dynamic growing area and zoning makes it more difficult then it's going to mean on the margin you're more likely uh, less likely to be able to move there first of all it may well mean that you decide that you won't need to commute um, from from some of the suburbs of that city, sometimes sometimes a bit further out, and drive in. So you can, you know, there's a big opportunity cost in terms of the amount of time and money you spend on commuting in or or, or traveling each day to work. And some people, um, because they're so uh, determined to get decent jobs in these cities, end up living in extraordinarily cramped and and, and uh, undesirable conditions as well. Now, it's much more difficult for poor families, especially those with children, to adjust downwards in that way in terms of the amount of space um, that, that, that they're willing to live in without very, very negative consequences. So I'd say that this problem is particularly acute for families with children who would find it less desirable to live in that sort of environment. One way that well-meaning urban residents have tried to address this problem of the poor not being able to live in their cities is through boosting the minimum wage, that you just – the poor aren't earning enough to live there. So just dictate by law that their employers have to pay them enough – a living wage, it's called. Is Do we have – what's the evidence look like on that? Because it sounds – I mean it sounds like a nice picture, right? You just mandate by law that people make enough money to live and then they can do that, which would be wonderful. Well, first of all, there's before we get onto the economics, there's a philosophical point here, which I find really bizarre, which is that the the living wage campaigns across this country and indeed internationally seem to be saying that rather than compensate you for the actual work that you undertake uh, during your working hours, an employer has a duty to compensate you for your external living circumstances, whether that be your rent, your food bills, how many children you have, and all of these other things. And that's a profoundly dangerous idea which has been picked up actually by, by members of the political class, including Bernie Sanders, perhaps most famously. This idea that uh, employers have a responsibility to pay you for all of your living circumstances. And if they don't, they are in some way being subsidized by the, the government because their employees are then in receipt of various welfare benefits. So let's let's park that philosophical issue for a second. Um, on the economics, I think it is fair to say that um, 
despite some of the warnings that perhaps economists on the free market side have made over many, many years about the jobs impact and minimum wages, um, minimum wages set conservatively overall for labour markets do not ha- appear to have major consequences in terms of their effects on jobs and hours. Now, they certainly have differential impacts on on different groups within that. Uh, Young and unskilled teenagers in particular seem to find it much more difficult um, to be able to find jobs or, or hours as a result of that. We see instances of companies uh, replacing low skilled tasks with machines and that you know one could imagine on the margin that's accelerated by higher minimum wages. But set conservatively, uh, it does not appear as if minimum wages have a massive impact on jobs. Now that said, studies that have looked at um, a much bigger minimum wage hikes, or in, in the case of Seattle being the, the obvious example, there was a University of Washington study that looked like looked at a, a, a two-stage hike in the minimum wage um, that was implemented there. Now the first the first effect didn't the first um, the raise didn't appear to have an effect on the overall labour market, but the second raise to, uh, I believe, uh, uh, to, to eleven dollars an hour did have a big impact, and it both reduced the number of hours worked by by low paid employees and reduced the number of jobs available so much that, on average, uh, people within that low paid group defined as earning under nineteen dollars an hour were actually worse off on average as a result of the policy. Now. The rest of the literature, from my reading, and there's a lot of back and forth on that, seems to therefore suggest that if you raise the minimum wage too much or too high, then you do get the effects that classical uh, liberal economists have long warned about. And secondly, and importantly, um, certain studies that in the past have found no impact of the minimum wage on jobs have tended to look at um, very specific industries, the restaurant industry as an example. Now, the fascinating thing about the University of Washington study is that they looked at the overall impact on low paid employees across the whole economy in Seattle, but also undertook an analysis just of the restaurant industry. And they replicated uh, the finding of other papers that in the restaurant industry, there didn't appear to be a big impact or if any impact of the minimum wage on jobs, but more broadly they did, which suggests that many of these previous studies that have proxied for the impact of minimum wages just by looking at the restaurant sector may have been missing much bigger impacts on other industries. Why wouldn't you see the impact? I mean, it just makes intuitive sense that if you you increase the price of something, people are will will buy less of it. So why wouldn't we why would the restaurant industry be able to absorb a, a minimum wage hike? Well, there's all sorts of ways that that different companies can react. One one um, one thing that means that it might not be picked up, and it depends on the time frame of your data, is that um, many companies don't adjust straight away. But it may well affect their hiring decisions next time they're deciding whether to expand or not. Uh, or, or you know, there are costs to laying people off as well. Don't forget, there are costs in terms of. Um, lost experience and skills. You've taken time often to get people used to working in an environment. Uh, in some companies, there are redundancy costs and all sorts of other things. So uh, it, it's costly to, to lay people off and, and it's costly to, to retrain. So as I say, one impact is that you might see um, future job growth affected rather than uh, an increase in unemployment there and then. Um, some businesses, no doubt, do use it as an opportunity to invest in uh, labour-saving technologies or increase productivity in other ways and make the the stock of jobs that they do have more highly productive than they otherwise have been. So they use the minimum wage hike as a catalyst for for rethinking their business. And you know, not all businesses are operating on maximum efficiency straight away. So some businesses can deal with it in that way. Um, and and some businesses are able, depending on how uh, responsive their demand is to to, um, at least put some of the costs through to consumers in terms of higher prices. Do we have do we have evidence of that? So these restaurant industry studies, do we see the restaurants raising prices after? I I personally see it all the time. They'll they'll even announce that they're raising prices because minimum wage went up. Yeah, there is there certainly is um, a lot of anecdotal and economic evidence. Usually the studies well quite often the studies 
um, don't look at both things at once. But certainly there have been many studies that have looked at the the impact of, on restaurants and fast food chains of increasing the minimum wage and have found that it was pass, uh, in part passed through in higher prices. Yeah. And of course, that can affect um, poorer people as well. Uh, if 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 that that kind of uh, price increase is primarily in in fast food outlets, which poorer people are more likely to spend money in, it seems another philosophical point, which is related to the one you said initially, is that there's something very odd about believing that these people are are not well off and then kind of commanding a business to be the ones who subsidize them as opposed to saying you know it's all of our jobs to get together and subsidize them directly which of course you 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 mentioned earlier is not the best way of alleviating poverty but making the business bear this entire cost is kind of odd by itself and you've seen some businesses like Amazon decide to, to voluntarily go up to fifteen dollars an hour, kind of, I think making this claim to that kind of moral authority, like we we will take us on for our business, our workers, pay them the living wage, the fight for fifteen. What do you think about when Amazon or companies like that make this big pronouncement that they're going to raise their wages? Yeah, well, I got annoyed <laughs> with a lot of people who messaged me or reporters who got in touch with me and said, "What do you think of Amazon raising their minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour?" I said, "Well, it's not a minimum wage. Let's let's be absolutely clear. A minimum wage." is a statutory uh, mandate of what businesses should pay um, in terms of a minimum and hourly rate um, within the state or across the country or, or within the city or whatever. What Amazon are trying to do is juggle uh, decisions which businesses are making every day, which is how much to pay your employees, taking into account what your long-term business plan is, taking into account the political pressure being put on you and, and your portrayal of your brand in the media, taking into consideration uh, the bad press that you might get as a result of that, and taking into account uh, your, the long-term profitability of the, of the company. Now, the interesting thing about the Amazon decision is that um, Amazon has been at the forefront for many years of lots of uh, investment in lots of labor-saving technology. They've opened uh, at least one that I know of um, convenience store that has, I think, one or, or doesn't have any in-house um, staff. Um, so they're very well placed as a, as a company in the longer term to make investments that lead to more productive uh, uh, jobs and uh, a lesser need for lower skilled uh, employees, particularly as robotics and things within warehouses become more prevalent. Now, they accompanied their announcement, of course, by saying, and as well as doing this, what we want to do is start lobbying the federal government to raise the statutory minimum wage to $15 an hour as well. And that will, of course, affect all businesses, including uh, their competitors, many of which will not be as well placed to, to, to deal with those changes and will not have the potential to invest in some of the technologies that, that Amazon do. But I do think in part they were responding to political pressure, particularly from, from uh, Bernie Sanders and others, and I do think that that is a crucial, misguided point uh, that Bernie was trying to kind of get across. He genuinely seems to believe that the existence of programs like food stamps and federal contributions to Medicaid and school meal vouchers and rental assistance and all of this other stuff represents a subsidy from the taxpayer to companies who are then able to pay less. And I just think that's wrong from a philosophical perspective, but also wrong. Uh, economically. And the reason it's wrong economically, if you think of your basic uh, supply and demand curves, all of those forms of welfare that I've just outlined that can, you know, you can receive in work, um, they're conditional on your income level. They're not conditional primarily on your work status. And so if you're paying people some money through virtue of their income level, uh, irrespective of their work status, then actually employers then have to offer higher wages in order to induce you to work because now you've got this welfare subsidy for not working. So actually it has the opposite effect of what Bernie said, which is it contracts the supply of labor. And so other things equal should be driving up uh, wages that, that employers have to pay. Now, it's certainly true that there are some um, in-work benefits, the earned income tax credit being the most obvious example, uh, that do, to a certain extent, subsidise uh, employers because the whole point of them 
is to subsidize people into work and the payment levels go up when you move in well the payment levels are there when you move into work and then remain high f- over the first band of income where you're where you're earning income and the result of that is to shift the labor supply out and reduce market wages now that helps the people who it gives jobs to it's not good for uh, perhaps substitute workers who are childless or in- ineligible for the benefits um, but the whole point of that program is to induce people into work because policymakers have felt that there are positive external effects from from having more people in work. So to to, to kind of summarise that, the the areas that he thinks the federal government subsidises employers aren't subsidies to employers; they're taxes on employers, if anything. Uh, I think he's fundamentally misguided about um, who should have responsibility for. Um, employees or individuals having an arbitrary, arbitrarily defined uh, level of income, which we consider socially acceptable. And curiously, the the types of benefits where you do see a degree of subsidy, he doesn't say anything about. And I think that's probably for the reason that um, there is quite a lot of evidence they're effective at getting people into work. Is there – so for Bernie, one of the reasons that he would say focus on the employer versus kind of our uh, a community, society-wide obligation to help each other, which would then cash out in terms of paying higher taxes for welfare transfers or whatever, um, might be that he's thinking in this kind of Marxist, all employed labor is exploitation sense. Um, so if you're if you're hiring someone, you're automa- you're just off the bat, you're doing something wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but <laughs> how dare you? But that's that view is not that common. Um, so what's the what's the reason why people who are advocating like we we need to boost the incomes of the poor so that they can afford houses in Seattle are pushing for a minimum wage increase as opposed to simply saying let's let's subsidize wages. Let's just do a straight up wage subsidy. And so if you're making less than 15, then the taxpayers of Seattle will cut you a check for the difference. Well, I think uh, a lot of people are politically astute and recognize that transfer programs are actually, particularly to working age people, not so much to older people, transfer programs are incredibly unpopular for people who aren't recipients of transfer programs. If you look around the world, almost any fiscal consolidation deficit reduction program first and foremost goes after working age welfare because actually it's incredibly uh, popular to cut it. Indeed, one of the reasons in my paper that I suggest that this this kind of um, supply side agenda on the cost of living should be something that appeals across uh, both platforms um, or both political parties or political uh, viewpoints is precisely that um, trying to boost people's incomes through redistribution is uh, fraught with the time inconsistency that views on welfare fluctuate much more than in many other policy areas. You know, you go from saying we desperately need to alleviate this pain and suffering through to welfare moochers and welfare queens. And that can occur, that that, that um, change can occur quite quickly. Whereas um, if you were to undertake quite robust supply side reform in a range of different markets under a overall banner of trying to reduce the cost of living, it becomes much more difficult to undo all of those reforms and it's, and it's not something that can change uh, dramatically. Now to go back to your first point, so that's politically, I think it's a recognition that certain transfer programs are unpopular. There has been a, a, an economic narrative develop in the last few years and whilst it's not quite the Marxist um, kind of viewpoint that you suggested that all um, employers, uh, kind of uh, evil capitalists, it's pretty much getting there, which is the idea that um, all employers have a degree of what's described as kind of monopsony power. Employers tend to to know better the the uh, the opportunities available to um, any individual employee better than the employee themselves across the, the different industry. Uh, they're privy to more information on um, on on the broader um, labour market because they quite often hire a bunch of different people and they interview them and all this other kind of stuff and that gives them a degree of market 
um, power to suppress wages below what they should be in free, open, and competitive markets. And that traditionally, that story um, was related to the idea of kind of company towns in the 19th century and, you know, mining communities where you'd have one overwhelming employer. I really do fail to see how that's even theoretically possible when we're talking about companies such as Amazon and, uh, you know, employing um, relatively small numbers of people except for in a, uh, in, in a couple of different cities, you know, but um, small numbers across a, a wide range of different places. And it certainly doesn't seem to me that there are many industries that you can conceive of where at a local level, any individual employer has that sort of power to determine wages outside of ordinary supply and demand, um, uh, uh, supply and demand functions. You write about these various programs, we've discussed some of them. Uh, how much does it add up to these, these ones that affect the poor disproportionately? How much does it add up to that, that maybe they're, they're getting uh, not fleeced by the government, but at least uh, f forced to pay higher prices for various things? Yeah, so I look at um, five different areas, which is housing, childcare, food, transport, clothing and footwear, and um, and then a broader occupational licensing, the impact of occupational licensing across the economy. And that incorporates, I believe, nine different policy areas. Um, I was incredibly conservative as I kind of have already implied in in looking at what the impact on, on people would be. But the direct price impact on all of these things, um, depending on where you live and how many kids you have, I'd say that for the for a household in the poorest twenty percent of the income distribution, the impact could be anywhere between eight hundred dollars and three and a half thousand dollars when you combine all of these things, which is a huge amount when you consider that uh, for the bottom twenty percent of the population, their total spending is around twenty five thousand dollars a year. So it's pretty big, pretty big chunk, and that can be much higher if you're um, in certain uh, Californian cities, for example, or you have. Uh, lots and lots of children, um, th those impacts could be could be greater still. Now, what I miss out in those figures, though, and what's important, is that all of these policy areas are areas where I conceive that uh, reform in the area in in the direction I'm talking about will also enhance GDP, and it will also lead to a more productive economy and so higher wages through through that mechanism as well. Um, and that would achieve higher wages, higher market wages, without some of the unintended consequences that you get with higher minimum wages, as we've already discussed, or more in the way of uh, redistribution. So I think there's, um, I think the impact is pretty large, and I think there are good um, political reasons why this sort of agenda should be appealing. Not least because it appears that we have hit diminishing returns when it comes to. Um, how redistribution and minimum wages and things can can improve the well-being of people at the bottom, and not least because we're facing a huge federal deficit as well, which should at some stage become a binding constraint against people suggesting more and more uh, wacky policy proposals. What about a federal jobs guarantee, which is another hot proposal from people on the left? So this is where you would simply if if I can't find a job working for a private employer, the government would essentially give me a job and pay me some minimum amount. I mean, that seems, you know, if if I'm not in the labor market, I'm not being productive. I'm not contributing to the economy. So, um, and we have lots. And I mean, I don't know how many people the federal government employs right now, but it's it's quite a lot. Um, and so, what's wrong with just increasing those payrolls enough to kind of get everybody on board? Well, there's a lot wrong with it. I mean, one of the things I'm really struck by by this is that um, the labor market in the US is pretty healthy at the moment. Yeah, unemployment, yeah, three point seven yeah. percent. Um, some of the uh, kind of African American Hispanic employment rates are the lowest they've been for decades. Yet the radical nature of the suggestions for what we should be doing instead um, seem to be proliferating at a rate of not. So not only have you got the, the jobs guarantee, but of course the discussion about basic income and, and everything that comes with that, negative income taxes and a whole range of other things. Um, now the the suggestion for jobs guarantees that we've heard from Bernie Sanders and, and Cory Booker's talked about uh, piloting and certain think tanks are pushing would in essence say that any private 
individual that wanted a job at $15 an hour plus healthcare benefits uh, financed through the federal government could have a job. Um, so it's not just people who haven't been able to find a job. Um, it's not just people who are currently unemployed or people who are employed part time but wish they were employed full time or people that left the labour market after 2008 now can't find a job. Uh, this will be open to anyone. Now, they they think that 16 million people would would take this job up. Um, that would make the, the, the program, if you looked at it on an individual basis, the largest employer in the world by far, <laughs> you know, by, by far, by order of magnitude, I think, bigger than the next uh, five biggest employers after that combined. Um, but even that only considers that the people that I talked about, people currently unemployed or want to work longer or um, recently left the labour market, take this up. In reality, if you're paying a job that uh, as its basis is paying you over $30,000 a year um, and you know that that job is guaranteed um, and you don't face the kind of perhaps market disciplines or unpleasant working conditions that certain market jobs entail, then um, I could foresee a situation where the number of people willing to take that up was dramatically higher than, than 16 million. And the real question is here, well, what would all of these people do? Um, Democrats have talked, Democrats have been pushing this idea, have talked about people engaging in infrastructure projects and uh, caring jobs and environmental jobs. And of course, I imagine at least some things that people will undertake in these types of things would be worthy in some way. But what this gets fundamentally wrong from an economic perspective, why it would be so damaging to the economy, I think, is because it fundamentally gets what work is about the wrong way around. The reason that work is inherently valuable is because people are engaging in the production of goods and services that other people are demanding. Um, that's where the value of the, the value added from work comes from. You know, that's the whole point of work. Work is a, jobs are a cost to, to um, the production process, but the reason that they're valuable is they add value in producing the goods and services that we all want. This tries to flip it on its head and says, jobs are inherently valuable. And what we need is to create work for anybody who wants to work. And it almost doesn't matter what they engage in. Now, aside from anything else, you can see when you view it in that way that through the the prism of kind of economic welfare, this cannot be anything other than very, very damaging to the productivity levels um, of the economy. Um, now, so that so there are big problems with it. First problem is I think way more people would take this up than um, than than is suggested by some of these proposals, and that would mean the cost would be astronomical. You know, you're talking about you're talking about um, anywhere between two and five percent of GDP, an additional program which I believe is bigger than Medicaid, uh, just just added to the federal budget straight away. Um, I think it'd be damaging for the economy for for that um, because it would be putting more resources towards things that are inherently less valuable for the reason uh, that I've outlined. And I think thirdly, it would be prone to a hell of a lot of corruption, and I don't mean just kind of the usual ostentatious corruption. But actually, um, political candidates and, and local areas which are kind of bidding for these federal workers, engaging in projects that that perhaps um, circumvent the political process in other ways. So one example that I've given of this is that I have no doubt that if this kind of jobs guarantee was on the books, Democrats in many areas would use it to push for um, uh, environmental projects. But equally, one could imagine Republican candidates uh, and in and, and particular areas, bidding for workers on the basis of wanting people to say, build a border wall, for example. <laughs> so I, I think when you combine those three things, the, the, the direct fiscal costs, the economic costs, and then the kind of corruption and perverse incentives, I just think it's a dreadful idea. I just, is there, is there provisions in there for like, you can get fired? Because if I, if I'm guaranteed a job, can I just like, not show up, but because I'm guaranteed, I'm still going to get paid or show up, but just not do anything. Or if I they decide if they can fire me, can I then just kind of go home and log into the website again and say, well, I'm out of a job. Give me another one. Well, that's actually a very, very good question because it's something that I thought about when I was reading the the paper by the Levy Institute. 
And they seem to suggest in there that whilst people would be judged on their output to a, to a certain extent, uh, they would not be held to market disciplines, which is actually one of the reasons why I suspect many more people would be willing to take these jobs up <laughs> than perhaps their initial calculations suggested. Much easier, because, yeah. Exactly. And if you know that there's far less risk and uh, far more economic security <laughs> from working in one of these positions, then I don't see why the number of people who wouldn't take it up would be much, much higher. When libertarians and conservatives, some libertarians and conservatives talk about the poor, sometimes they talk about in an insulting fashion that the, the, the poor deserve their lot and you know they don't deserve welfare or things like this. But it seems like your vision is a little bit different, that, that they've been held down by various things to, to live worse lives by government programs and that this is something the way that libertarians should talk about poverty rather than attacking the poor and believing that the market order is just. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that, look, we could imagine a situation where there was no, there were no redistributed programs and no minimum wage or whatever, and we could all speculate as to as what the outcomes in that market economy would be. It seems doubtful to me that um, we'd be in a situation where every single poor person was better off if there were none of these programs uh, whatsoever. Um, uh, but equally, it, it seems likely to me that uh, if none of these programs existed, we'd see significantly more in, in in way of civil society or charitable institutions undertaking a lot of the functions that, that governments have. So we can kind of park that um, theoretical debate. I think the useful thing about this type of agenda is it, it offers something to everyone. Um, to liberals, I can say, you don't have to believe that all welfare programs have failed to think that they're actually undermined by all of these regressive regulations which drive up the basic cost of goods and services. I mean, the money that you transfer people isn't going as far in delivering high living standards as perhaps you would like. But equally, you can turn to conservatives and say, well, one of the reasons why we're seeing demands for high living wages and minimum wages, and one of the reasons why we're seeing this, um, the, these policy proposals, jobs guarantees and uh, uh, Medicare for all and all of these other programs is precisely because people at the lower end are struggling in part under the burden of some of these regulations and some of the demand for new programs or demand for improved generosity of increasing programs uh, comes as a result of the need to compensate people uh, for these bad policies. So I, I don't think you have to be um, conservative or progressive to think that this is an agenda that you could sign up to. The basic point I'm trying to get across is that irrespective of your views on redistribution, irrespective of what you think on the economics of a, of a minimum wage, there are clearly a bunch of things that governments do to drive up the cost of necessities. And that has direct financial impacts on the poor. It means they spend more than they otherwise would need to to obtain the same goods and services but it also makes the economy far less efficient and reduces market wages at the same time. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please rate and review us on iTunes. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.